Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. Today's episode is part of a special series called Making a Difference, Supply Chains for a Better Tomorrow. Now, the current COVID-19 pandemic is creating many challenges for uh, companies and organizations around the world, but it's also a catalyst for change and innovation. So what supply chain capabilities will separate the leaders from the laggards, not only in response to this current you know, crisis, but in order to succeed in the years to come. Well, that's the main focus of the series. And, um, you know, it's great to have uh, the following uh, folks to join us in this conversation today. We've got Greg Ackner, who is VP at Cap Capital Logistics. We've got Jay Gustafson, who is Senior VP Marketplace Solutions at Echo Global Logistics. And then we've got uh, Dan Sisurchi, who's VP and General Manager of Transportation Management at Descartes. And, uh, it's great to have them on the program to share their experiences and their perspectives on this, uh, on this topic. So again, I want to thank them all for, for joining us today. And uh, we're just going to go right into the, the, the conversation. And, and Greg and Jay, I'll, I'll start with you guys. And maybe, Greg, you, you can go first. I mean, over the years, you know, we've talked a lot about the importance of you know, agility and flexibility and responsiveness and supply chain management. And, and those capabilities are, are even more critical today as again, as companies are trying to navigate through this COVID-19, you know, crisis. And, and in many cases, they're, they're kind of leaning and they're relying on the logistics service providers to, you know, to help them. Can you share some examples of what you and your customers are experiencing at the moment? Sure. Um, thanks for having me. Um, you know, a couple of things that we're seeing out there, just, you know, we work pretty heavily in the food and beverage and, you know, you see, especially in the beginning of the COVID quarantine, you see, a big spike in demand, then you see the come off, then it starts to, to build up again to what we're deeming as more of the essential products that are really being shipped as the non-essential businesses are closed and how these changes are taking place. So you see, for example, you know, we do business with a really large national retail grocer. You know, we're doing two or three truckloads of milk a week to their distribution centers on the East Coast. And all of a sudden on a dime, it's, uh, it turns, they say, we need 40, 45 trucks. So, you know, having the technology, the ability to process, process that rapidly and also get that news out to our business partners, our marketplace where we need the help, where this customer needs the help, you know, staying on the forefront technologically using Algex, using, you know, macro point, making sure that everything is in place, running smoothly and having that ready to go to be able to make these changes. You know, another thing with our people working at home, it made it a lot simpler being cloud-based. So being on the forefront of that technologically and being able to use those tools was a really big help. You know, that's, that's uh, you, you know, uh, what you just described, that huge spike in demand, you know, in, in that grocery, you know, sector. I mean, I think that's one of the things that we're seeing that either it's been this, you know, um, huge, uptick in demand and having to respond to that or are there are other cases where it's a you know basically everything's shut down and then how do you respond to that right and how do you become you know more efficient in an environment where you know a lot of your business has has uh, you know come down now i know i i think i saw a press release or some some something to the effect of you you guys also participated in something called the million gallons challenge can, can yeah. you talk a little bit about that what what, what that is so it was kind of a local um food bank program they're developed you know they're putting together, the short of it is, is that one of the food banks and we've got the local kitchen, some chefs, some restaurateurs, got them all together, putting a million gallons of soup together to donate to, you know, local charities, lo you know, for the need in, um, you know, lower Westchester County here in New York. And we got involved, we partnered up with one of our, one of our regular carriers, one of our partners that we use, you know, on a daily basis for warehousing, trucking, all that type of stuff. He has these portable converted shipping containers that are converted into uh, cold storage facilities, you know, frozen and fresh temperature. So we are able to partner with them to get them donated to this million gallon challenge to put them on site. So they had the space prior to which there was no way they were storing that much of this product. So we were able to get them that, get it on the ground pretty rapidly within you know, I think it with the turnaround time is about 12 hours from when they asked they were on site. 
Yeah, that that's great. I mean, it goes with with again the the theme of the series, you know, ma making a making a difference because I think that's the other thing that we're seeing here is the logistics community really coming together um, because you know you you are the connective tissue, if you will, of getting product out there, whether it's to the supermarkets, whether it's to the you know uh, the first responders or people in the front lines and so forth. So I think that's a great uh, example there. So Jay, uh, over to you now. Um, you know, I know you've done some similar things uh, as well. Can, can you share a little bit about, you know, how this current environment is impacting you and your customers, and you know, give some examples there? Yeah, no, I get it. And Adrian, thanks for having us on today. Um, you know, as I think back to like the early days of the COVID pandemic becoming a reality, I was really proud of how Echo reacted to both keep the safety of our employees in mind and, and getting them all home, you know, very quickly. Uh, we operate off of cloud-based software also. So for us, the systems were already in place. It was more the logistics around getting the hardware to the, our employees' homes to allow them to be successful. So while all of that was going on, we saw the surge in demand across the grocery and, and certain segments of uh, you know, consumer goods, you know, really surging. So there was a lot of, you know, moving pieces taking place in that mid-March timeframe and our ability to be flexible and act with a sense of urgency to keep our employees, our carriers and our clients, you know, all top of mind, you know, really made me proud as a, as a leader, you know, at Echo. And um, it allowed us to be super successful in terms of how we've performed both, uh, in the immediate days after the pandemic and how we've continued to support our carrier and client partners, you know, for the last 10 weeks now, it's crazy. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, both of you really kind of showcase the, the reality that, you know, not only have your customers had to be responsive, agile, and, uh, you know, in responding to this crisis, you know, you yourself as the, the logistics partners have had to also, be responsive, agile, and and be responsive because you know you're an extension of their you know of their staff. Now I know for you at Echo, I mean some of your client, you've done some things with some of your clients as well. I know I saw yeah. some I think press releases as well in terms of kind of the 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 changes that your customers had to go through. You know I think it was uh, Everblock Systems and Blinking Owl. Can, can you t just briefly share what those uh, case studies were? Yeah, you know as I think back uh, back back. The last two months, you know, there's very few industries or customers that were operating in a business as usual environment. So we saw many shifts in demand patterns from the clients that we worked with, both from a geographical standpoint where we had to pivot and reposition equipment to help them with surges and volumes out of certain areas of the country. And then we actually saw clients pivot their business models in certain ways to accommodate the new reality of, you know, a post pandemic America. So two examples of that would be um, a customer that we work with out of California called Blind Owl Distillery. They are a producer of, you know, artesian craft liquor, and they pivoted their business model to start creating hand sanitizer and created a local, we helped them create a local distribution model where instead of uh, you know sending you know bottles of liquor to different uh, wholesalers throughout the Western Eleven, they were beginning to provide hand sanitizer and other um, protective equipment or you know uh, liquid to hospitals and other frontline um, responders. Another one that I thought was a really cool situation was we have a customer called Everblock that makes modular building systems. And as the mayors throughout the United States started to think and plan ahead of how they were gonna handle surges in cases related to the COVID pandemic, we helped them set up 2,000 pop-up beds in New Orleans. We organized 35 truckload, ship, truckload shipments over, a, I think, a week time span. Each of those required team drivers, consistent, visibility from an electronic tracking standpoint and we were able to help them get the materials to New Orleans to quickly set up this you know hospital so we've uh, you know each week is a little bit different um, right now we're seeing clients business patterns you know shift but as certain industries 
you know, see declines in demand, we're seeing surges in other areas of uh, other verticals throughout the United States. Yeah, no, those are great examples. I mean, you're seeing companies having to stand up, if you will, completely new supply chains or distribution lanes and everything else as they're, you know, trying to shift to stay alive, if you will, or find new streams of revenue. Uh, so I think those are two good examples. I think now, you know, as a more and more states are starting to open up a little bit, I think like to your point, um, you know, I think we'll start seeing kind of the, the patterns, you know, begin to change a little bit uh, as you know, well. One so thing I would just add, you know, while, while Echo and, and Capital both service large corporations that have, you know, their own logistics departments, many of the customers we serve, they don't have logistics expertise. So when things get a little bit hectic like they are right now and they need to focus on their core business, I think it's been really uh, – you know, nice to see companies step up and be able to help them figure out what creative solutions from a logistics standpoint we can bring to the table to help them, you know, serve their, their end customers or a new customer base they're now creating a, a product for. You know, that, that's a great point. I want to explore that a little bit later in terms of, you know, uh, what, what this means moving forward in terms of collaboration between, you know, the different sure. parties here. So let, let's, uh, I, want, I want to get back to that, you know, to that point. Uh, Dan, uh, just bring you into the conversation now. Obviously, you work with a lot of uh, different, co- you know, customers across different companies and, and industries. I mean, are you seeing that COVID-19 is serving as a catalyst for change and innovation in supply chain logistics? And, and if so, in what ways? Sure. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, companies like Echo and Capital, I mean, they're market innovators. So these types yeah. of disruptions, they're kind of prepared for. We see kind of the long tail of, of uh, uh, brokers in the space that are moving. I mean, we've kind of gone from what I've seen is fear to focus. So we've, we've moved on and the, uh, the human spirit has kicked in to say, what do we need to do to, to continue to move? And some of it's around, as, as Jay mentioned, you know, business changes, business model changes. And some of it's really about the technical agility, like Greg had hit on, of being cloud enabled um, and really focused on how do we work better with our, our technology partners uh, to get the right data and, and, and do the right things. Um, and more broadly, we've seen um, some of our tools on the uh, capacity side, which I was surprised uh, have been uh, as popular. So kind of given the current softness in market, we have our broker customers coming to us saying, yeah, but we want to improve the relationships we have with our carrier partners. And with better data, we can have better, smarter conversations and ultimately move transactionally to relationship-based in terms of how we're in, uh, communicating with our, with our carrier partners. Um, and then finally, I think operationally, trying to take the, the team that they have in place and, and give them the tools and innovations to make sure that they can spend less time in the, in the trenches transactionally. And again, like I was saying, more time focused on relationships with their customers and their, and their carrier partners. Yeah, and no, I think you, you raised uh, some, some great points there. And again, I think it comes down to the, the fact that, you know, we're, we're, that all the stakeholders in this industry are, are connected to the one another, right? And you've got the shippers, you've got the brokers and the logistics service providers, and you, you know, you get the carriers as well. Right. And, and really at the end of the day, it's, it's balancing, you know, and working together to get through, you know, through this environment. You know, one of the other things that'd be interesting in your thoughts, you know, I'm seeing a lot of as well as, you know, you're seeing obviously home delivery becoming, you know, uh, that, that was always a trend that was moving up, but I think this is accelerating that transit to home delivery. And, and along the same lines, you're seeing things like contact less delivery is something else that you're hearing a lot about. Is that something you're hearing from your customers as well, Dan, in terms of, you know, more home delivery, you know, leveraging technology or innovations around contact less delivery? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we see, again, going back, we, in business, we use that agility word, uh, but yeah, being able to pivot from, uh, from modes and industries as volume changes. And I think Jay, you hit on it where we're seeing spikes in some areas and, and, um, and less volume in others. We're seeing that in mode shift too, and really giving, um, you know, companies like Echo and Capital the ability to, to still deliver on the commitments they make to customers, even as their customers' customers uh, change in terms of how they engage, purchase, and, and consume as we're in a, in a different world now. Right, right. 
Well, to go back to, to uh, uh, Jay and Greg, and Jay, I'll, I'll start with you first, and then Greg, you can answer the same question. Uh, yeah. You know, so building off the, the, you know, the theme of the series, I mean, what does a supply chain for a better tomorrow mean for, for your company? I mean, in other words, I mean, what supply chain capabilities are you adding or strengthening, whether it's in terms of people, technologies, or, or, or services, to not only help you navigate through this crisis, but also to position you and your customers for success for the long term? Sure. So I think the way I would answer that question, and it's it's not something that I think we we certainly didn't realize this during the COVID time period. This has been uh, an area of focus us for the last you know few, few years. We've seen an evolution taking place within the industry. It's often described as you know the digital freight marketplace, and and the way I like to describe that is you know carriers and brokers, brokers and shippers interact throughout the day there's lots of different areas of the processes within those stakeholder groups that are really you know painful that have a, a ton of friction and there's they're ripe for automation they're ripe for delivering a better experience to both the echo employee but also um, the stakeholders we deal with within the carrier and, and the client community so we're continuing to focus on just the our ongoing you know digital evolution and from my standpoint, there's really three pillars that um, that's focused on. I'd say the first one, and Macro Point's been a, a Descartes has been a great partner for Echo in this area is, you know, shipment visibility. This has been an ongoing trend over the last five, six years. You know, we've certainly seen a ton of progress from my perspective over the last, you know, 36 months in terms of adoption. Um, the technology and the integrations really working the way we, we want them to as, as end users. So that's gonna to continue to be a, a big area of focus and it's not necessarily about obtaining the data, it's about what we do with that data to make intelligent, forward-looking decisions to help us you know, proactively manage future exceptions. So the second area that we're really focused on is streamlining business operations and communication with our you know, carrier community. And that isn't um, like a, a one size fits all approach. You know, trucking companies span from a single driver and a truck who make a decision to, you know, 1,000, 5,000 truck organizations. That's who Echo deals with, everybody across, you know, that spectrum. So we have to have a variety of strategies at place from, you know, a web, mobile app, API integrations that allow us to interact digitally with these carriers and you know, I'd say one of the areas we've been really focused on over the last 12 months, and certainly an area that we're gonna be focused on looking forward is capacity matching and displaying available loads opportunities to carriers and letting them you know, book freight digitally, but still have that relationship they can rely on at Echo if they have questions, if they have exceptions, or they don't feel comfortable interacting within you know, a website or a mobile app. And then we're also focused on, you know, streamlining our interactions with, with the shipper community. And that could be providing them with instant multimodal pricing through our proprietary platform, Echo Ship, through API or EDI integrations, or it could be figuring out, you know, new ways of using that, that rich data that we have from a visibility standpoint and, you know, sharing that information with them to allow them to make you know proactive decisions so our efforts really around a better tomorrow are focused around i'd say you know the heavy areas of operations within our business that are often focused on track and trace and exception management helping carriers find freight more efficiently and helping shippers gain pricing and access to instant capacity through you know digital automated channels yeah, those are some great points. I mean, I think, you know, historically, there's been a lot of waste and inefficiency, you know, across the entire end-to-end -end transportation process, right? A lot of, you know, paper-based systems, a lot of manual uh, processes. So I think one of the things I'm seeing is obviously one of the, uh, you know, talking about how one of the uh, effects of COVID-19 is really, I think, going to accelerate this digital transformation, which is, you know, analysts and folks have been talking about for, for, for quite some time. I think that's going to accelerate th that in, in the industry as, as well. Uh, Greg, your, your thoughts. I mean, what, is, what does uh, uh, supply, uh, supply chain for a better tomorrow mean to you? And, you know, what, what are some of the things you're doing to 
again, not only position, uh, you know, not only help you navigate through this crisis, but also position yourselves and your customers, um, you know, for future success. Sure. You know, when I, when I got to Capital, um, I came and met with the owners and the mindset was to do things, you know, be on the forefront, make sure that we're taking advantage of what's available to us. We're not builders of technology. We don't hire developers. We don't, you know, we don't build platforms. That's not what we do. We're logistics people. We know the logistics business and that's all we really want to do. You know, so what we like to make sure that we're on top of is what's going on in the industry technologically, making sure, you know, that we're taking our time to learn about what's out there and being put in use, going to trade shows, things like that, learning about, you know, taking advantage of all the API based you know, companies that are able to tie into Algex. So we're constantly, constantly reviewing, trying to improve that. People-wise, we're always looking to, you know, add good people to our company, people that understand the industry, people that know what's going on. Um, but mostly, you know, what it means to us is figuring out a way that we can partner with, you know, the good side of the industry. What you see a lot today is, you know, people really trying to take advantage. You know, whether it's the bad shipper taking advantage of the driver, whether it's the bad broker taking advantage of the carriers or however many times you've heard it uh, in any sort of, you know, forum that's out there, you see what's happening. You know, it's while we want to do business with a lot of people, we don't have to do business with everyone, um, you know, and that goes on both sides, both the shipper and the carrier side. And, you know, the way that we look at it, we, the way that we look at the industry is, you know, we want to treat people fairly. We want to be treated fairly. We want to work with people that are all in the same mindset. So bringing everybody together to do this is what's going to, you know, we're hoping to spread that type of culture throughout the industry. Um, you know, again, we want to be technologically, we want to be as far in the front of the line as we can be. And we'll let other people develop and take advantage and buy those products and use it. Um, and, you know, we want to be knowledgeable when it comes to logistics and have that technological capability and partner up that way. So that really is the basis of where we're trying to build capital logistics and where our mindset is. Yeah, you, you raised some great points there. You know, uh, you know, if I heard you correctly, and you, you talk about the importance of relationships, right? Relationships and having the right relationships or alignment uh, between your company and your culture with those of the carriers you want to work with and the, and the shippers you want to work with. And then you also talked about relationships in terms of focusing on your core competencies, but then also relying on partners. You know, in this case, you have Descartes as one of your partners, right? To kind of um, have them bring the technology capabilities that you're reading about, you're learning about, you le you're looking to you know, implement as part of your operations too, to your point, you know, stay at the forefront of what's happening uh, in the industry. So I think, you know, um, you know, at the end of the day, it is truly what we've always said in supply chain. It's not just about technology, but it's also about people. It's also about processes as well and relationships. So I think all, both of you brought up some great, you know, points there. So, so Dan, I mean, kind of similar question, you know, for you. I mean, what ultimately, you know, looking forward, I mean, what supply chain capabilities will separate the leaders from the laggards in the months and years to come? Yeah, and I think we've hit on some of these and, and uh, uh, Jay kind of outlined that and, you know, both Capital and Echo are good examples where we can be a technology kind of augmenter to the, 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 the big guys like Echo and then be some more of a technology platform and back office provider to, to, uh, to brokers like Capital. Uh, but if I think about kind of the the separation of leaders, it, it's like a lot of industry shocks kind of historically is focus and innovation seem to be kind of the keys to differentiate. Um, and I think kind of breaking that down into three things. First, it's ease of doing business. It's the normal blocking and tackling of a brokerage, making it easier. So getting rid of some of the manual offers and uh, bill of ladings and rate negotiations. How do you automate that to be a to be a better partner in the in the ecosystem? Um, I think the next piece is the innovation to enable relationship growth. I think there's a lot of uh, of talk around freight marketplaces, and I think that that's kind of where the there, there are progress towards that and where we see that is really enabling the, the, the marketplace type features to allow relationships to be the differentiator 
Um, and then I think the last thing is what we've seen over the last 10 years are the, the companies that have been successful are the ones that have all the data. Um, the companies I think going forward are going to be the ones that they don't just have the data, but, but they know how to use it. So, you know, there's, there's private and, and semi-private and public marketplaces. So, you know, we see in our, in our uh, capacity co-op platform where you have, you know, participants where they're sharing data that they typically underutilize to get a, a 20, 30 X return on data that, that they can utilize. So innovation is much more around how do we differentiate against the data that a lot of people have versus being kind of the, the only holders of the data. Um, so certainly interesting times and um, you know, I, I think we'll see a lot of change in terms of market leadership as, uh, as people really, again, focus on innovation and relationship growth. Yeah, a lot of great points there. A couple of things that, uh, that, that you know, kind of uh, uh, I liked. One is, you know, you talked about, you know, focusing on, on innovation. I think right now for a lot of companies, and you can make the argument it's the right approach in some ways, is, you know, with business down in many cases and so forth, there's always this tendency when times get tough to kind of tighten the belt and just focus on cost cutting. And then a lot of the innovation and forward-looking things kind of get pushed to the side or get cut and so forth. And I think history has shown that it's those companies that are able to balance, right? You want it, you have to control costs in some ways, but you don't do it, you know, at the expense of continuing to innovate and continuing to invest in your people, continuing to invest in, in, in the future, right? Because if you do that, if you focus solely on cost right now and cost reduction and, and you know, you, you're ultimately going to put yourself at a disadvantage when, you know, the things turn around. Uh, so, so I thought that was, uh, you know, that, that was a great, uh, you know, point there. Um, you know, just so, as a way to wrap up, and Greg, I'm going to go to you first, and then Jay, you can, you can wrap things up for us here, just to go to the last question. And I think we, we've kind of touched upon this, you know, already a little bit, but, but I think as a way, I think it's a good kind of ending question is, you know, a popular phrase we're hearing a lot right now is, you know, we're in this together. And, and that's certainly true for shippers, logistics service providers, uh, and, and technology companies. Um, you know, how do you see these relationships evolving, you know, moving forward? In other words, do you see the industry becoming more collaborative and partnership focused moving forward? I do. Um, I see, you know, one, one, of the, one of the points that Dan had made with the flow of information, making it easy to do business with, that's really, you know, it, it needs to become easier even if there, you know, something as easy as standardized type of paperwork. It's just the flow of information needs to be better there's so many instances where you know the driver the dispatcher didn't get the information to the driver the driver shows up he doesn't have the right pickup number and all these things that take the time and delay it and get you know humans that are on the floor actually doing these things upset so you know doing what we can do to get correct information as rapidly as possible you know and sharing information between shippers brokers carriers you know, I think that's going to be, you know, some of the things that you're going to see taking the industry to the next level and the companies that are doing that, the companies that are doing things well, you know, those are the companies that are, you're going to see succeed. Those are the companies that gain the word of mouth in the carrier community, you know, capital is doing it right. They're paying fair rates. They're, you know, they're giving you the right information. Their pickups are, are solid. Their delivery appointments are actually legitimate. All those things, you know, carriers talk, you can go on Facebook and look at these carrier forums and, you know, some of these companies get blasted, some of these companies get praised and, you know, it's, it's out there. Technology, it's a different world. It's like I tell my, my wife when we talk about our kids, it's like we didn't grow up with a computer in our pocket. We have a completely different world to control. And that is, that's everywhere. That's not just my family. That's, that's every day that we go to work. So you know, it's, it's a brave new world and it's an even newer world now. Mid, I'll call it mid pandemic. I'm not going to call it post pandemic yet. <laughs> yeah, the great, great points. And I think, you know, you, you hear a lot of things, you know, historically you've heard about being a shipper of choice. You've heard about now you also hear about being a broker of choice, right? For, for the carriers, right? You talk about competing on, on customer experience on the shipper side, right? And retail side, but you're also competing on carrier experience, right? So you as a shipper or a carrier, are you providing that carrier with the experience that they're expecting, right? So I think that that all boils down to everything you guys just talked about in terms of what's going to position 
you know, everyone for success here. It really boils down to, you know, treating everyone fairly, treating it, you know, providing that level of transparency everybody, you, you know, expects and good level of honest communication, you know, between yeah. all the parties. Um, uh, Jay, you know, to, to wrap us up here, your, your thoughts on, you know, uh, uh, collaboration and partnership uh, moving forward. I certainly think it's an ongoing trend that we'll continue to see, you know, occur within the industry, likely expedite over the next, you know, 12 to 18 months. You just made a comment about, you know, transparency and how some of these digital platforms are bringing more transparency to the industry. I really think that that's going to be one of the mechanisms that really powers, you know, future collaboration. So, you know, from my standpoint, um, this business is going to continue to be very, you know, relationship focused. And as I think about how our teams at Echo spend their time with the carriers and the clients that we support, I actually think it's going to be even more of a relationship focus as we move into the future, because a lot of the mundane operational tasks we ask them to do throughout the day are going to be, you know, digitized. You know, the, the days of answering a phone call and being asked where a driver is are going away because you can log into a portal and see that information, you know, now. So that time, all of those phone calls that people used to spend supporting these operational requests of their clients can now be focused on building deeper relationships, better understanding their business, figuring out ways to use data to bring new solutions to the table. And, you know, I, I really believe that that combination of technology, relationship, and ability to create actionable insights off of data are, is going to be like the winning recipe as we think forward um, uh, about how a 3PL and a carrier and a 3PL and a customer build meaningful partnerships. Great. Well, I think all, all great points. And again, I, I think this has been a great conversation. I feel like we could probably talk for, for another uh, you know hour or so on, on this topic. And there's so many different dimensions that we can we can go into, but I think you provided some great insights and advice and, and, and food for thought for, for our listeners out there. So, you know, Jay, Greg, and Dan, thank you all for, uh, you know, making the time to, to be with us, particularly in, you know, uh, this very busy, uh, you know, time period for, for all of you. Um, I want to thank those of you that, that joined us. If you're watching this episode on demand, either at the Descartes uh, website or on Talking Logistics, and you've got a question for or a comment for any of the speakers, you can post it there, and I'm sure they'll be more than happy to uh, get back to you that way. Again, thank you for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you in a future episode of Talking Logistics. Have a great day. Thanks, Adrian.